on this Final Four and Major League Baseball Season Preview Edition of the Sports Section, brought to you by Covers.com and UWager.eu. We preview the Final Four with the latest key trends, our predictions, as well as the Major League Baseball futures to watch for the World Series and more as the Sports Section returns and is on the Prime Sports Radio Network right now. All right, it's Wednesday, March 28th, 2018. I'm Greg DePalma. Before we get started, make sure to visit Covers Experts. That's experts.covers.com for the very best in sports betting info. And don't forget, take 50% off any purchase by using promo code PRIME50. That's PRIME50. I'm going to introduce our... Covers handicapper to the show. He was with us to preview the college basketball tournament. He's also the publisher of the Playbook Football Preview Guide magazine, the Playbook.com website. And uh, he actually is sitting pretty right now after correctly predicting Loyola for the regional final championship at 60 to 1. Mark Lawrence. Mark, good to have you on again. Nice to be back, Greg. I hope you're enjoying the basketball tournament as much as I am. Well, I'm a Michigan fan, so uh, <laughs> I am. Uh, and, uh, and and I did pick Kansas to win the championship, so I am. So I'm sitting pretty nice as long as well, – at least I've, I got a 50-50 shot, right, to get to the championship game. Yes, you do. You have uh, two pretty good teams, both favorites, and seeing as they're both favorites, likely one of these two teams will be playing for the championship game on Monday. Well, uh, your uh, regional pick, Loyola, I, again, if you look back at 60 to 1, uh, just to get to the final four, so your work is done. You know, when you make a prediction like that, that is the big difference. And of course, you usually don't go into regional picks too much looking for one seeds, but you try to look for the sleepers. And, uh, and, and I think, we, you know, we've seen it now. I don't know what it is, six straight years, maybe seven straight years, where a seven seed. Uh, or lower or worse, if you want to put it that way, has now made it uh, to the Final Four. And as crazy as this season uh, has been, uh, even before the tournament, uh, we should have expected a seven seed or worse, and we got one, an 11 seed. That's really going down far. But Loyola was a team that a lot of people were thinking, okay, maybe they can win a couple of games, but I'm not sure anybody thought the Final Four. I don't think so either. We had to find Cinderella wearing a size 11 shoe, if you will, 11 slipper this year. But uh, nonetheless, Loyola is the Cinderella. They've made it this far, and uh, tip of the hat to them. Their head coach, Porter Moser, who's done a great job with this basketball team. In fact, I share this with the USA Today, and we might see this in the paper before Friday, but uh, he's never lost a postseason tournament game outside the conference. He swept the CBI, huh. Moser did, Went five and zero to win that title. Okay, and he's four and zero in the NCAA. So you know, to his credit, he's been there nine times. He's won every one of those basketball games. So, I guess you could say losing is foreign to him at this time of the year. Yeah, I mean, when we were talking uh, and going over your uh, March Madness playbook, and we talked about, I mean, the one, uh, the, 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 and I think it was like um, might, might have been like on one of the very first uh, pages, uh, you had the the eight elite elements. And uh, we talked about how uh, over the years, 16 of the last 17 NCAA champions had these eight elements. And three of those teams in the Final Four were in those, uh, were, were a part of that. And you only had five teams. You had, and two, the two teams that you did not, that, that did not make it, well, one, Duke. So. That's okay because Kansas beat him, and Kansas was another team. So basically, that that kind of washed out. So really, the only team that didn't make it that was a disappointment was Michigan State. But uh, considering they were in the same region as Kansas and Duke, you kind of again that kind of washes it out. So I, 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 you know, and again Loyola, that's that's just a crazy kind of thing anyway. So it looked like this. Uh, th this, uh, again, if you want to call it a trend or a stat, it worked once again. And Candace, Michigan, and Villanova, one of those teams, uh, again, unless Loyola wins a championship, uh, one of those three teams will wind up making it 17 of the last 18. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Uh, you know, those elements are all very common elements. You know, you're asking teams with experience that play offense, play good defense, have a good coach. 
all part of those eight elements, uh, it's a common denominator, and it really has served well for these basketball teams. And three of these four teams, as you mentioned, are all uh, qualified teams. And uh, those three teams, Michigan, Kansas, Villanova, are all very well-coached basketball teams. Yeah, and again, we're not talking about 16 or 8 or, or 12. I mean, there were only five teams. So uh, three of out of those five are still left, and that just shows you uh, that that is something to keep an eye on for next year, no question about that. Now, I looked at the final four notes on the playbook, and a couple of things I wanted to ask you about. When you get conflicting trends, like, say, Loyola and Michigan. So you got Loyola. Uh, one of uh, I, I I notice here number eight seeds or worse are two five and one ATS in the final four. Yet teams off of uh, four uh, or more uh, against the spread wins are seven two and two against the spread. And Loyola right now is twenty one and one straight up in their last twenty two, eighteen and fourteen against the spread in their last twenty two, and they've covered six straight games. So that's a conflicting trend there. Throw in the fact that Michigan has covered seven straight games. Uh, I mean, well, let's get to it. We'll, we'll keep Michigan out of this for, for, for a second on one of them. But on this other trend with Michigan, uh, I noticed where, where, you have, where you have teams who have scored 65 points or less in the Elite Eight game are 7-2-1 and one against the spread. So that's Michigan. And also uh, Big Ten favorites of more than one point are 4-0 and oh against the spread. So you have a few in there that are very conflicting. Uh, what do you do when you have conflicting trends? Do you go with one where you go, well, if one of them is four or five, like four or five on their side, and the other one only has maybe one on their side? That's how you balance it out. Or do you just use that as as it's just an all encompassing part of your playbook? Well, the trends, as you mentioned, can be dizzying, especially when you have conflicting trends like you just mentioned here. But the bottom line is looking for what brings you value to a basketball game and which basketball team you feel will win the game. So coming into this matchup here with Loyola and Michigan here, two obviously red-hot basketball teams, the thing that jumps off the chart the most to me is the fact that Loyola has won and covered beat the spread every one of their tournament games thus far. So you find a team that's uh, done just that. They're 4-0 straight up and against the spread. They make it to the Final Four. What do these teams do? Well, when they're underdogs, the role that Loyola is, and they're only 2-16 and 16 straight up with only five covers, very difficult role for teams that have beat the spread every game in the tournament that are dogs to continue that march. So okay. it wouldn't, su- wouldn't surprise me to see Michigan, who is one of our uh, Elite Eight element teams, advance to the final round here. I know it, it's been all good and uh, wonderful for Loyola, Sister Jean, and everybody that's followed the Ramblers this year, but... You know, two and sixteen is a real tough number, especially against a team like Michigan out of the Big Ten that's playing some pretty good basketball. So again, that that trend that you're talking about it has to do with a lower seeded teams that make it to the Final Four. No, really, it's any team that makes it to the Final Four that has beat the spread all four. Oh, games. All four. So doesn't that also include Villanova? It does include Villanova, but uh, like I said, the underdogs are two and the sixteen with, with only five covers, but the favorites. Have gone seven and four straight up and against the spread, so it's good for the favorite. Bad really for the bad, dog. really bad yes. for the dog. The favorite seven and four is kind of it's good. It, it's not anything that I think should be earth shattering. No, it's it's not. It's not gonna. It, maybe it'll tip you over the edge, right? But 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 seven and four is kind of borderline as far as the percentage that you really get too excited about. Correct? Yeah, I'm not gonna bet a game on seven and four alone. Mm-hmm. If I if I had other cases that I was making for Villanova here, it would only add to the arsenal per se. Uh, you know, and I'm certainly not going to bet the Villanova or I mean the Michigan game strictly on the the two and sixteen Loyola stat. Uh, I happen to take a small side to Michigan in the basketball game. The two and sixteen stat sort of uh, is more ammunition, if you will, to the game. But uh, the Villanova stat, while it supports them in this particular role, there's other things in the Villanova game that do not support the Wildcats. Yeah, uh, with the Michigan Loyola game, uh, one of the things I did notice, of course, that everybody we, we got an opportunity to see right after the game uh, on C uh, and I don't know what it was TBS or CBS, whatever, put it up and and showed the uh, the, the 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 total of the seeds that the, I think it was like 25 was the number that Loyola had beaten, and that was the highest total, meaning that they had been pretty fortunate to get to the Final Four. Uh, as a low seed, or as a, as a, you know, as a, yeah, you could say that that was able to get there by beating not a lot of high seed teams, and 
that to me is kind of interesting, especially since they won a lot of close games. Here's a Michigan team that is definitely going to be a huge step up for them. Uh, they're going to have to play even much better than they played before. And they're going to need Michigan to kind of play uh, like a few of the games that they played earlier on, like maybe pretty pre, pre sloppy offensively, like against Houston or Montana. Because if Michigan shoots the ball or just has a good game, I just don't see Loyola having a chance at all to win this game. I think I think they're going to need Michigan to have a really bad shooting night, and Loyola is going to have to have even a better game than we've seen so far. That's usually the case when you find underdogs at this late stage of the tournament. They have to play a, a really good game, and their opponent has to play a really bad game for them to advance. Uh, in Michigan's, uh, in regard to Loyola playing all of these uh, lower seeds, if you will, with these with these weak seed ratings, so too has Michigan. The uh, the highest seeded team that Michigan has beat in this tournament has been six seeded Houston. So H H Michigan's had a soft path as well just to get here. And in fact, if Michigan makes it to the title game, uh, they'll be the first team to make it to a title game that did not beat a number five or a uh, higher seed along the way. So it's been really a cushy path for the Michigan Wolverines as well. Yeah, the other thing is, and I think this is also important, and and, and uh, Bayline discussed it and they talked about it uh, also. I think uh, it was uh, Kenny Smith even uh, mentioned that Michigan is like uh, Loyola 2.0. And, 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 and he's really spot on is that Loyola is a very similar offense. And really, it's just a similar coach team is, is they've got guys that can shoot the ball. They're very, very sound uh, coach team, very good defensively. But that's everything Michigan is. That's how Michigan's here. Michigan's here because of their defense. Michigan's a three point shooting team. But the difference is, is Michigan is just has a little bit more talent. And they also have a player that Loyola doesn't. And that's Mo Wagner. And if Wagner has one of his good games, I'm sorry, but again, like I just said before, with a, with a different type of scenario, just Loyal is not winning this game. They need Wagner to have one of his bad games. I'm sorry. They're not beating Michigan if Wagner's on his game. There's another unique situation involving Michigan in this game that I don't think a lot of people are aware of, and it's the fact that they won the Big Ten title when they won Four games in four days. Yep. It's not very often you'll find teams that'll do that and then make it to the final four round. There have only been two teams in NCAA tournament history that have done that. Won okay. their conference tournament four straight days in a row, then made it to the final four round. That was Connecticut who cut down the nets, if you remember. I yep. think it was 2011 or 2012. And it was also Louisville who did it uh, right around that same time. Connecticut made it all the way to the finals, cut down the nets. Louisville did not. Louisville lost in this round. But... That being said, the two teams that did make it to the final four round both each beat the spread. All right. <clears throat> as far as the Villanova game, going up against Kansas, and this is going to be the third straight Big Ten, a Big 12 team for Villanova. As we mentioned, they've covered every one of their games. They've won every one of their games by 12 points or more. Uh, for Kansas, uh, let's keep in mind they've won three straight games as a dog, including the, the win over Duke. Uh, they also won the Big 12 championship game as a dog. They're 4-1 and one this year as a dog. Uh, uh, Villanova, is. We, we all know how well coached they are. We know they've got championship players on their team and all of that. Uh, but part of the reason that I liked Kansas, and I think we saw that in the Duke game, because that was just probably one of the better games we've seen in the entire tournament. We, we got an opportunity to see two really good teams play each other, which is a rarity in this tournament. And the game goes to overtime, and it was a really good game. Uh, but what I liked about Kansas coming in was is that they, they they have senior players that are pretty pretty talented, and that's kind of rare at this level. And 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 I don't usually pick Kansas, but the reason I picked Kansas this year was because of the fact that this was the first time that I had seen a Bill Self coach team in a while uh, that didn't have all of those one and done guys, you know those blue chip players that looked like they were more about themselves. This is the, the best team that I've seen Candace and Bill Self have. Uh, who knows? Maybe since they won their last championship. I would concur. Uh, this is a team that also doesn't get a lot of respect. Uh, we saw that even going as far back as the big 12 conference championship game when they were an underdog to West Virginia. Uh, they just spelled that, and they've gone, obviously, here in this tournament well enough to make it to the Final Four. They're the Rodney Dangerfield of the number one seeds in this NCAA basketball tournament. Nobody gives them a lot of edge or a lot of chance, but I do. I think they're really well coached. They play a really good, solid brand of defense here. And uh, you, Like I say, you've got Villanova here on this four-game straight-up-and-point spread roll here. Somewhere along the line, you usually 
trip up or hit a minefield. Sure, sure. And you know, and, and if and if Villanova doesn't hit that minefield in this game to uh, to take themselves out, I think they could at least hit that minefield to at least not beat this spread. Yep, this yep. is just too too good of a Kansas basketball team to be laying five points to at this stage of the tournament. Yeah, and I, and I also say you know it's a tough choice you got to make because Kansas is almost a two to one dog to win the game. So that's awfully tempting to be able to get a number one seed like Kansas, the way that they're playing, and be and be able to double your bet. Of course, you're going to risk those five points being taken away, but that's the choice you have to make. And I think it all depends, of course, on what your bank is. I mean, if you're if you're feeling pretty good, you're on a good roll, you've got you know you don't have you don't need to be safe. And you can take a little bit of a chance. This is one of those opportunities. I think you should go ahead and take the chance if you like Kansas. I do, and I took plus uh, plus the two dollars on Kansas in this particular role. Uh, you know, I love the fact in in, the, in our tournament guide we called out the fact that uh, whenever you have matchups of number one versus number one seeds in this round, the underdog has gone six and two to the spread, which is favorable to Kansas here as well. So okay. I like Kansas plus the points, and I also like them on the money line at plus two to one. All right, let's go ahead and talk baseball. And the baseball season, we had our playoff, our regular season uh, preview show the other day with Steve Merrill and uh, Scott Solatoro. So uh, I asked them to give us some uh, World Series futures and some win totals. Uh, I'm going to ask you the same thing, uh, but before we get started, uh, on on that, uh, talk uh, about give give us some potential sleepers, some some long shot teams, and maybe even some teams that you think would be worth uh, a future play that might be more than twenty five or thirty five to one. Because I, this is a I tell you, I, I if baseball as we know is a sport that teams can be pretty deep to start the season with their futures and win the world championship. Not if I think it'd be pretty deep in their futures by the all-star break and still win the world championship. Uh, But this is just one of those years where you just look at the way the teams were last year. And it's like 80 to 90% of the teams that were really good last year. You feel the only way they're not making the postseason this year is they have a rash of injuries. You you, you really do think there's only going to be maybe besides injuries occurring, two or three new teams in the postseason. And if that does occur, then that's going to be a lot harder to find some uh, sleepers. So give us some. Well, you know, when I'm looking at these uh, Major League Baseball uh, teams, I'm looking first at their season win totals to see how they were adjusted from last year to this year. And uh, looking at that adjustment, looking for value, that's what we're ultimately looking for. Looking at that adjustment here, the biggest adjustment that was made was the Detroit Tigers, who last year's season win total was 83 and a half. It's 67 and a half this year. Mm. So they, there's 16 games that they've taken out for what they anticipate being a down year for the Tigers. I would not disagree with that. I'm just pointing out that fact. Okay. On the flip side, the teams where there's been uh, the biggest adjustment was the Milwaukee Brewers, who last year's season win total was 69 and a half. Now it's 84 and a half. I can't understand that one simply because there's no Jimmy Nelson for the Brewers to start True. the season here. Uh, Junior Guerrera uh, is gone. They sent him to the minors. He was their opening day starter last year. Yep. There's not enough pitching for Milwaukee to warrant 84 and a half wins. But that being said, we're looking for value on a sleeper team. And I would say if I had to throw a sleeper team or two out there, one would be given good health, and you can't handicap health, but yep. if, it were, if it were to occur, the New York Mets might have the best pitching staff in Major League Baseball if they can keep their pitching staff intact. And they added Jay Bruce to the lineup. Uh, they added Todd Frazier to the lineup here. Uh, I think they have a, a, a value chance. Their season win total is 82 and a half here. Uh, the National League is going to be you know, wide open. It's going to be the Dodgers. Everybody's got, got them obviously penned in. But uh, we're talking value now. We're talking long shots. We're sure. talking Loyola Chicago is yeah. who we're talking here. Sure. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would I would put the New York Mets in the conversation, and I would also put the San Francisco Giants in the conversation. Uh, that you know they added we as we know uh, Longoria and McCutcheon, uh, two big sticks in the lineup here. Austin Jackson comes in the lineup here. They're going to work with Posey and Pence and Crawford. That's a nice nucleus for a baseball team, and if they can keep that pitching staff intact. You know, Baumgartner to pitch most of the baseball season here. Stratton's a real under the radar kind of an arm. He's going to do well. Johnny Cueto. 
Cueto and Bumgarner are as good of a one-two tandem as there is in baseball here. That would be my other Loyola sleeper team, the San Francisco Giants. Uh, do you know if the, uh, re, you know, since uh, Bumgarner's injury, and again, he'll be back, uh, who knows, maybe uh, a couple of months, uh, who knows, but he's going to be, at least he's going to be play compared to last year. Has have the futures dropped at all significantly? I think they were roughly what twenty to twenty five to one before the injury, or right around the injury. I don't know if that would make it drop considerably. What are they right now? Do you well, know? they're twenty two to one right now as we're speaking. Okay, you know, so they fit that range. The Mets are thirty to one right now. They fit that range as okay. well. So, you know, there hasn't been any major adjustment to the Giants with Bumgarner because his injury isn't a season injury. Okay. And they're and they're anticipating having him back. So, you know, we're looking at a twenty two to one dog in the Giants you, and a thirty to one dog in the Mets. Would you feel like it's better to wait with the Giants and see if you get better odds as they potentially struggle the first month or so without Bumgarner? Well, I think it would be better because a lot of the play is based on what I think the Dodgers coming back to the pack this year. Okay. And if the Dodgers do come back to the pack, somebody's going to have to rise in the West, and I think it would be San Francisco. Uh, you know, the Dodgers are heavily priced here. Uh, they oh, went yeah. on one of the greatest win schemes in all of baseball last year. What were they, 43 and 5 or something? Oh, it's over, crazy. Over, crazy. Over a four, that's, we're not going to see that this no. year from the Dodgers. No. Which means they're not going to be to that level this year that they were last year. So if the Dodgers do come back, you know, I would probably make the San Francisco play looking to see the Dodgers are not performing to the level that Vegas anticipates. And I do have a healthy giant uh, pitching staff here. Okay. I'd make my move with the Giants at that time. All right. Now, what about the favorites? Again, the Dodgers are right around 6-1. to one. I know Houston and the Mets and the Yankees, excuse me, look like they might be the co-favorites at this point, right around 5-1. to one. Then you get the Indians, the Cubs, Washington, and Boston. Th- those are your top teams. Uh, when, you, when you're talking about low numbers, though, like L.A., Houston, and the Yankees, it, it, this all depends, doesn't it, on, on what you're like. If you're in Vegas for the weekend right now, and and let's just say that's what that's the only time you do it. You don't do sports books. You just you're at Vegas, and you're gonna you're not gonna be in Vegas again till football season. So I'm gonna do some baseball stuff. I uh, would you still would you would, would you prefer to recommend more of the sleeper stuff now as opposed to the five to six to one stuff? Because it's so early and, you know, you're you're investing in something that's going to take you seven months to pay off. You might as well just even come back four or five months later like you're going to come back. And maybe your your odds are only going to be slipped another point or two. And then if you still like those teams, go ahead and take them then. Well, the purpose of playing uh, long shots or looking for value uh, is looking for sleeper teams right now. Uh, if you're looking to play the New York Yankees, the Cleveland Indians, those types of teams, you're better off waiting until the, uh, they make it to the to the playoffs and then play the price that's adjusted accordingly. The last thing you want to do is to lay, uh, lay the New York Yankees, who I think are going to be an under team this year. I think there's just way, way, way too much hype about them, and both Judge and Stanton are going to have to perform to what they're capable of doing. Sure. So rather than laying 4-1 to one with the Yankees right now, I would rather wait, if you like them, I would rather wait till the World Series got here, see who's involved, and if they're not the best team in the American League, they may be a 4-1 to one dog at that time, okay? okay? So you're better off not tying your money up over the whole course of the baseball season being wrong on the yep. Yankees. Yep. Make sure you're right and wait till they get to the playoffs. What you want to do right now is you want to isolate these underdogs that uh, you think could be the surprise teams that end up sleeping in there, slipping in there, much like we were talking about the San Francisco Giants or perhaps the New York Mets. Okay, before I uh, let you go, uh, let's take all the odds and everything else off the table. Who do you like? Who, who, who do you like in the World Series right now? I like the Cleveland Indians and the Chicago Cubs. Those are the two teams that I like. Uh, the Cleveland Indians pitching staff is as deep as all of anything in baseball. And if you look at what they did in the spring training this year, it was phenomenal. I do a lot of handicapping on what I call walk to strikeout ratio. That means what what their percentage of uh, strikeouts to walks is. Okay. Every Cleveland starter was four to one or better in spring training awesome. this year. That's awesome. Uh, the Chicago Cubs. I like them this year. I like. I look for a rematch, a replay of the 2016 World Series. Yeah. Uh, and I, I do like the Cubs makeup this year better than I did, or better than what they were last year. Uh, they were. They're, they're not priced as heavily this year as they were before. True. True. And uh, I, I like the makeup of this team. I like. I think uh, in. The addition of you, Darvish, that pitching staff with Quintana and Lester and Hendricks, that's a fearsome foursome. Uh, they could be very, very good. And I think they could end up uh, beating out who will be Washington or the Dodgers, the two hot teams in the National League this year. Yeah, you're getting almost double the price that you started off with last year. 
uh, with the Cubs, but, uh, potentially eight to one uh, in uh, in the books. And they also aren't coming over with the hangover of winning the world championship. Uh, the only thing I'm a little bit concerned with the Cubs and I and, and, and I might be and, and, and if anybody's out there trying to put money on the Cubs is what I would say is, is give it a give it a give it a little while. Let's see if Brandon how he does Brandon Morrow as a closer. I mean, Brandon Morrow, sure, he looked really good last year, but he wasn't the closer. He's never been the full time closer for a championship team before. And uh, I also want to make sure he's going to be healthy. I mean, this is a guy this is a guy that's got an injury history. So. Uh, not and look, I know the Cubs can go out and get a reliever at the deadline, but they don't have the type of farm system they had a couple of years ago. That ain't going to be so easy for them. And I'm not even sure that that's what they want to do anyway. I mean, if they go, if they dip back into their farm system and make any big time trade deadline deals, they're going to strip their farm system and and, and they're not going to have anything left. And I just don't think that that's the direction that they want to go. So I think if if you're wagering on the Cubs. As opposed to you just saying, you know, I think the Cubs will be in the World Series, as I said, without the odds. Uh, my advice would be just check out Brandon Morrow for a little while. Just, you know, make sure that he can handle the job. And and, uh, and if you feel confident with that, then uh, maybe you can go with him then, as long as those odds don't drop too fast. And I don't think they will. Good words of wisdom, uh, especially when you're incorporating such a vital piece into that pitching staff, that closer. And uh, you've also got the, 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 the Joe Madden factor, the eyebrow raising factor, <laughs> the moves that he makes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you never but, know. Yeah, but I still think I, I agree with you. I think the bottom line is uh, there's value to them this year oh, as opposed yeah. to last year. Yep. And uh, I'll put them with the best pitching staff in baseball and see what happens. Yeah, matter of fact, uh, my uh, Nationals are my team, but Steve and Scott both picked the Nats to win. The, the world championship and I didn't even get them into the world series. Uh, that's, that's purposeful. Uh, and then, uh, but I did pick Cleveland. I picked Cleveland just like you. So I, I had Cleveland and, and, and my other uh, national league pick was Arizona, which is a nice little sleeper too. So I think Arizona is going to be better than they were last year. Uh, I'm not hung up on Martinez leaving. Uh, I like the depth of their starting staff. And I think their starting staff depth is going to be excellent. I think that uh, Barchi Bradley assumes the closer's role. Uh, that's going to be better than Fernando Rodney. So plus they're a younger team. They're going to be hungrier, confident. I like Arizona. I think Arizona might be able to surprise people considering their value. I think they're being undervalued right now. I'm not sure why. Uh, because they're they're very similar on paper to what they were last year, except for J.D. Martinez, who wasn't even there until after the trade deadline anyway. Well, you know, always you'll find a team that uh, stepped up out of the shadows, and they did so because a starting pitcher had a career year, and that could be the case for Walker this year, Taiwan Walker, uh, on that pitching staff here. He's got the ability. He's got the stuff. And if he ends up uh, out pitching Zach Greinke this year, oh, that would be the big. Diamondbacks could yeah. have a great chance. Yeah, because yes. Robbie Ray did that last year for them. So right. uh, if Walker could do that, that'd be big. Uh, Mark, before I let you go, what else is going on? What are you working on? Uh, obviously, this is a huge time of year. So this is this is as great as, as it gets for a sports fan over these next uh, couple of months. You know, with the beginning of the NHL playoffs, the beginning of the NBA playoffs, the Final Four, the Masters. Uh, this is the, 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 most, the biggest part of the season, really, for thoroughbred racing with the Kentucky Derby and the Triple Crown and the prep races. The baseball season begins. I mean, seriously, the F NFL draft. I mean, the, you can't get a better time of year outside, of course, of, you know, the meat of the football season uh, on the calendar. No, it's a great time right now. In fact, I'm a big horse racing fan. I'm going to be going to the Gulfstream Park this Saturday for the Florida Derby. Oh, I'll throw yeah. A little, uh, little uh, horse out there that I think has a chance to upset the field. His name is Catholic Boy. Okay. Uh, he okay. Comes from Tampa. He comes from a big race at Tampa Bay. And okay. horses that come from Tampa Bay, it's a real cuppy track. When they go to a, a, a lightning-fast asphalt track, they do real well. So keep an eye out for him in that that in the Florida Derby. But what I'm working on primarily is our our magazine, our preview guide. Uh, that's a mountain of work, and uh, we've got our, our staff here at the office going around the clock trying to get that ready for this 2018 football season. Isn't that something, that you get started on that uh, right around? We haven't even hit the draft yet, and no. you're already getting that football <laughs> magazine ready uh, yeah. for 2018. Well, that's when it, that's when the work's got to be done. So what was that, Catholic boy you said? Catholic boy. Catholic and, boy, and, okay. And Catholic boy. Uh, I'm not Catholic, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> just the, I think the horse stands a chance. You'll be I'm Catholic saying. for a race. Yes, and, and, and uh, by the way, we are we, we, we are going to have our horse racing show with John Hardoon from the Sheets, uh, and that's going to be uh, live. We're going to do a live show. Uh, uh, I guess probably I think post time is probably about what quarter to seven, I think, on Saturday. 
So yeah, we'll, it's going to be late, right? Yeah, so we'll do a live show, and uh, we'll definitely, uh, we'll, when that horse comes around, I will, uh, I, I will bring up uh, that Mark Lawrence is uh, live at the track, and this is his horse. So, Mark, I, I appreciate it. Thanks for coming back again, and we look forward to talking to you again uh, real soon. Again, it's a busy time of year. I look forward to talking to you again. My, uh, my pleasure. As always, Greg, enjoy the basketball games this week, and I look forward to catching up with you down the road. Thanks, Mark. Be good. All right, that's Mark Lawrence. And, again, uh, you can go to the Covers website. There are a couple different ways to get to the Covers website. Simple, covers.com. But go experts.covers.com. And if you do that, then you go right to where the experts like Mark Lawrence are. And as I mentioned at the open, you get 50% off any purchase at Covers Experts by using promo code PRIME50. That's PRIME50. You get the great information that somebody like Mark, who's been in the industry forever, nobody knows the handicapping industry better and longer with as much intelligent information as Mark Lawrence does. And, and hey, that's why when we went over a whole bunch of those college basketball trends before the tournament began, and on this show regarding the Final Four, uh, they work. And you just got to figure out, of course, which ones are going to work for you. And that's what Mark does. So we'll talk to you, by the way, on Friday at 1 o'clock for more college basketball coverage with Steve Merrill and with Scott Zolatoro. That's 1 o'clock on Friday. And uh, like I said, we'll be on here probably about 6.30 on uh, Saturday for the Florida Derby preview with John Hardoon from the Sheets. So those are a couple other big shows. We've got some football shows. I'll be interviewing Jeff Holland, one of the uh, players that will be participating in the draft this year, 2 o'clock tomorrow. Dan Shanka will be with me. Uh, we'll also, by the way, be talking NHL. That's right. NHL is back on the show, uh, on the network. And uh, we are going to have, of course, Jan Levine, our NHL analyst, and Dave Koken from Covers is going to join us. Uh, and that is, uh, that is at 11 o'clock Eastern. On Friday, that's the last hockey show in the regular season here before the playoffs. So that's Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern. So thanks to Mark Lawrence and Greg DePama. You're listening to the sports section on the Prime Sports Radio Network. Follow us on Twitter at PrimeSN. We'll see you next time.